Welcome to episode eight. This is your host, Nathan Crane, and I'm also the creator of the Search for Sustainability documentary series. And tonight's episode, we're going to explore some myths and show you why they're myths and what you can do about it and explore the possibility of whether you're living in the inner city, you're living in an urban environment, a suburban environment, or a rural environment, what you can do right now, this moment, and into the future that will help you be more sustainable. We look a lot at food production systems as well in this episode simply because food is one of the most important things that we need to have control over, right? We need to have self-reliance with, we need to have sustainability with, as you've learned in previous episodes. And there are ways to do it in the cities and just outside the cities and obviously in rural environments. And there are also ways to do it in rural environments that are much more sustainable than most farmers or most people living in a rural environment actually are doing. So this episode's pretty exciting. We look at some other areas of sustainability as well for living in the city and living in suburbia and living in a rural environment. And we look at some permaculture things that you can do. So it's really an exciting episode. Um, the interviews are really empowering. I'm super happy you're a part of it. And I encourage you to continue sharing this with everybody you know and everybody you love. Talk to them about it, share what you learn, and share this series with your friends and family so that we can continue to inspire and reach the hearts of many that we may turn around this ship of sustainability for the planet and move forward into the future in a way that's going to create a thriving opportunity for all of us as human beings. So thank you and let's dive into this next episode. The last time they tested conventionally grown apples, they found 29 pesticides in that apple. It's in every cell of the apple. I don't think so. Pardon me. You know, I'd rather have a shrivelly apple that has wormholes in it that I found on a tree that hasn't been touched. I don't need a perfect apple. That's the other thing. There's this whole like thing around your food is supposed to look perfect wrong. If it looks perfect, it probably has no flavor. And it probably doesn't have much of anything else either. And that's just depressing. I'm not going to pay 10 cents less for a bunch of bananas that I don't know what's in them when only for 10 cents more I can get organic bananas. What? I don't know. You know? I mean, it's got to be I would rather go out, walk out my back door, and eat nothing but f food that I could find from places that I knew hadn't been sprayed with anything than go to the store if I can't get good food. More people are discovering that food plays an important role in our health, 
But what's, what's not as well known is, is the way we grow food has a direct impact to both climate change and the health of our oceans and our health of our soils. And carbon farming or regenerative agriculture is a, is a new way to look at farming where we, uh, where one of the goals is to take the carbon that's in the atmosphere. We have too much carbon in the atmosphere. We can return that and put it back into the soil um, and increase the carbon content of the soil. And while carbon is not good in the atmosphere the way it is today, leading to you know climate chaos, uh, it's actually good in the soil. So it's all about balance. So we put carbon in the soil, retains more moisture. Um, uh, we don't need, we can drought proof our soils more. And it also uh, improves the nutrition of the foods. Um, and what's happening right now is, is the carbon is falling from the atmosphere and it's going into the oceans. And in the last 50 years, the oceans have become 30% more acidic. And what happens when you have oceans becoming uh, more acidic? Uh, the plankton starts to die and that's what's going on right now. So we're really in a crisis mode where we're acidifying the ocean and the major cause of greenhouse gas emissions is actually agriculture, industrial agriculture, not the transportation industry, Chevron or, or, or Exxon. So and that's, a, that's something that's, that's not well known. So we can literally take the carbon that's up in the atmosphere in the ocean we have too much of and we can cycle it back into the soil through regenerative agriculture practices such as composting, cover crops, um, planting more trees, uh, planned grazing, and working with nature instead of against nature. And literally if we don't do it, we're going to acidify the oceans and they provide two-thirds of our oxygen. So this is like literally like a 911 for uh, the health of, uh, of, of the planet. Sourcing locally means we're supporting our own food shed. And um, food shed is just a fancy word for uh, can you grow enough food in a given region to support its population. And there are all sorts of reasons to do that. Um, food security, um, the health of the environment, the health of the population, um, and farmers markets really started as this sort of underground movement that allowed small farms, small producers to access consumers. And one of the things that I like to say about our founders is they, you know, amplified, accelerated the movement because now you can't swing a stick in D.C. without finding a chef or a restaurant or a school that's not committed to educating folks about local um, and what it means to eat local. We've even coined new words, you know, in 17 years, locavore. And, uh, and so it, it means a lot to support um, the people that grow your food, to look at them in the eye and, you know, share a smile with them and hand money to someone who's actually creating your food. Um, the other side of that, the reason why uh, not doing that is unsustainable, uh, has everything to do with agriculture that's uh, been subsidized heavily, uh, outgrown its, um, its useful uh, capacity, um, and is harming the environment uh, at a scale that is uh, not sustainable. So we're, um, we're proud of the work we're doing. Um, we've got farmers now in, in Maryland that are growing grains. Um, it, it's been probably 100 and 25 years since grain has been grown at any you know broad scale in in Maryland so exciting we have um, significant numbers of people here who are very much into sustainability we're growing vegetables in the governor's gardens that we then give to the food pantries we're going vegetables in with the flowers in the city parks that then go to the food pantries. So it's a natural for us to go down and petition the city council. And one fellow even showed up in a chicken suit. And we talked about the fact that, well, as I said, when I was growing up, every backyard had some chickens. And it wasn't, and, and we also brought in the facts about how dogs and cats have worse diseases that are transmitted to humans than chickens do and so on and so forth. So we got behind that. Then we passed a law that says that we have a cottage industry law. You can produce things in your kitchen, jams, jellies, rolls, breads, various sorts of things, if you're only doing no more than $5,000 worth of business. 
for each product, you can sell them out of your house. It's a $20 license, I think once. I don't think you have to keep getting it. And if you have overflow from your garden, you can go down, set them up at a table right out front your house and sell them. It have to be fresh produce. You, this has to be just, you know, right out of your garden. But that is a law where in a place like I live, which is a food desert, the closest grocery store would take you half a day to walk there and back. So we can grow food, sell it to our neighbors. I can grow green beans. They can grow corn. We can switch back and forth. And the government is now supporting it here in Denver. So we're doing some new stuff and it's so worthwhile. It's so good. Self-reliance is huge and it's not selfishness. It's just like my own personal story of struggling with my weight. If I didn't heal myself first, I would never be able to offer my value or skills and talents to other people. I needed to heal myself first. I needed to take care of myself first. And it's not in a selfish way or an egotistical way. It's I need to take care of my health so I'm able to help and serve other people. You know, so I think I'm a true believer that, you know, once you give yourself some self-healing time or just like you know first thing in the morning i like to meditate and i give myself some time to just get still with myself realize what my intentions are for the day and just like okay i'm good i'm clear now let's go about but working in community is huge supporting other people there are a lot of people you can't do everything yourself honestly you cannot do anything yourself you need help you, and it's okay you can ask for help people are willing to help you you just have to ask for it and um, yeah, you can realize what your skills are and what assets you have that you can offer of value. Whenever I meet people, I always try to think, okay, what are some things that I can help you with instead of what can I get from you? And I think that's the best thing you can do is like, if you can help other people, it's a win-win situation. So I have a new book out and it's called The Permaculture City. Uh, it's really, it's not just urban permaculture, but that's kind of the buzzword that people use, urban permaculture. But it really is how to apply what we know about permaculture to cities and towns and suburbs. Uh, the way I think of it is anywhere where there's more pavement than plants, I guess, you know, non-rural areas. And the reason that I wrote this book was because most of humanity lives in cities now. It's well over 50%. And the idea of getting your place in the country is a wonderful dream, and a lot of people are doing that, and probably a lot of people are gonna continue doing it. But the reality is that a huge chunk of human beings live in cities. Most of our resources are consumed in cities. Most of our products are made in cities. Most of us get educated in cities. Most of us learn a lot of things and spend a lot of our time in cities. And cities are where a lot of our culture comes comes from. So if we can't have more sustainable cities, uh, we're in trouble, <laughs> basically. We really need, you know, cities are a really important part of the mix and they've often been kind of neglected um, in many of the sustainable disciplines because we all think about the country as where we're going to go to be sustainable. And that's, that's great. I've done that. I totally recommend it. It's great to have a, a lovely piece of land, but a lot of us who live in cities don't even have land. You know, we might be in an apartment or maybe a little postage stamp or something like that. So what the Permaculture City book is, is addressing is, what do we do for those people? How do you work with, how do you grow food in the city? Or how do you, just to, to open it up to a little broader level, how do you create sustainable food systems in, in a city? How, how can I, as a city dweller, have be participating in a sustainable food system. And I might be able to grow a little bit of my own food if I've got a yard, but I'm certainly not gonna grow lots of my own food. So what do we do to help create sustainable food systems in cities, starting with your own garden, but then moving to things like community gardens and community supported agriculture and farmers markets? How do we encourage the local groceries to buy locally and support local farms? 
So, so a chunk of the book, about a third of the book, is on sustainable food systems and you know, gardening in the city, as well as gardening in community, because a lot of what we do in cities has to do with other people. We've been in, uh, we've been in St. John's here for four years now, and I, like, I was living off grid before, and I kind of adopted St. John's as a, a place to do a project of trying to get, all, get a, a neighborhood sustainable with growing our own food and our own medicine. And uh, so that's how this thing kind of started. But when I was living off grid, I was, we did a lot of cool things down there and, and uh, it just wasn't getting out to anybody. So I didn't, it didn't feel like I was making a difference. So I wanted to come back and turn other people on to some of these ideas I had of uh, making, having a more sustainable lifestyle. So for the food growing piece in cities, I think the biggest challenge there is access to land. Uh, either you have a small yard or you may not have any yard at all, or if you have a yard, there might be lead in the soil or something like that. Um, the problem of soil toxicity is a big one. So a number of the things that I talk about in the food chapters are how do we find land? Where, where is there liable to be good land for growing, or whether it's a community garden, uh, an unusual place that places that have lands are churches, offices, and apartment buildings. They're getting to be more and more offices that are actually having employee-supported agriculture programs. Turns out Google actually has a chief horticultural officer or some job title like that. It's, a, it's someone who's, who's in charge of their, you know, their gardens for the employees. And a lot of businesses, Pepsi, a lot of other big corporations are starting to really look at getting healthy food to their employees, employees volunteering to work in gardens and, and those sorts of things. So offices and churches and apartment buildings often have land around them. The city tends to own a lot of land that a lot of cities, Portland, Oregon is a really great example of a city that's looking at urban agriculture and trying to make its city-owned land more available uh, for people to do, to do food production on it. So a, a big focus of the food chapters is how do we find land in the first place? And then once you've got land, how do you make it really productive? How do you get a lot of food from a small space? Can we do vertically, vertical gardening? Can we do rooftop gardening? Can we do gardening in containers? Now, what are the techniques in a, in a place where land is really at a premium and you may not even have any land at all? So that I'm trying to deal with the reality of land's expensive and sometimes even unavailable. So what do we do about food? Yeah, since we've come into the neighborhood, a lot of people are uh, turning their lawns into gardens and um, planting for beneficials, you know, monarch butterflies and bees. And uh, there's been a huge movement in growing your own food. And, and medicine is coming up as well. Um, people are starting to grow a lot of their own medicine, especially with the way the pharmaceutical companies are, are going right now. So where most people like to landscape or decorate with flowers, I'm kind of more of a practical girl. I like to decorate my pots or plant around my house with herbs. And so I like to have all sorts of edibles around my house. Um, we have our main garden, of course, but then in my flower pots, you'll find things like thyme and peppermint and oregano. And for me, I love just the experience of going out on the front porch while in, I'm in the middle of cooking supper and snipping off some fresh herbs. The taste is just incomparable compared to what you get at the store. Um, but I, I, for me, if I'm going to put the effort into growing something, I love putting it into growing something that I can eat. I'm not saying I'm against flowers necessarily, but I love, uh, I just love growing food. There's something so fulfilling about that for me. A lot of people think that you have to have land, uh, that you have to have a backyard, or that you have to have space, and that's absolutely a myth. Most people don't realize that almost all organic farmers do not own their own land. A vast majority of commercial farmers don't own their own land. There's tons and tons of ways to do it. There's of course, you know, the community garden, which is a route. And then of course, there's also just go ahead and start farming on that vacant lot down on the corner, which is a possibility. Of course, you may get it all <laughs> torn up on you, but you know, you get some growing in. Uh, but actually there's lots of resources online for, I believe it's shared earth, uh, different websites where homeowners who say, I have a backyard, uh, but I don't have time, offer it to other people who want to grow food and then they work something out with the harvest or not. Sometimes they just want people there to do it. So there's lots of ways to go about it. I'd read a study that in Manhattan there are 44,000 acres of usable rooftops with enough sunlight to grow food. That's a lot of food that could be grown in Manhattan. <laughs> so this area here is just our kind of a demonstration veggie garden and uh... 
eventually it'll be perennial plants that you walk through and buy, but right now we're just, we're just having a demonstration garden, just something to have some fun so it won't be all weeds. But we just got this property this year and uh, we're really excited to, to get some pathways through here and, uh, and make it more places to, to buy um, like bigger blueberry bushes and mulberries, stuff like that, fruit trees. So we can we sell some more perennials. Perennials are really important in the backyard because um, you get a lot more produce off them for the amount of work that you put in and, and per square footage as well. So if you plant a per, per, perennials is a, is a good thing. The local um, sustainability community is really great here in DC. We have, um, you know, um, everything from wonderful community gardens to um, groups that come together to, to accomplish all kinds of social justice and environmental uh, sustainability here in the DC area. So it's also a good local community as well as a um, great place for doing this work. Uh, Fresh Farm is a nonprofit that runs uh, 13 farmers markets now in the DC metro area and our mission is to provide economic opportunities to small farmers and producers. Um, now I know a little bit about that as a small farmer and producer uh, and uh, first encountered Fresh Farm Markets as a uh, small cheesemaker in Western Maryland and access to this uh, bustling uh, urban market was essential. Uh, we wouldn't be here today if it had not been for the access to farmers markets that Fresh Farm provided. Um, and uh, my relationship then deepened with Fresh Farm. I was asked to join the board. I uh, have happily served on the board now for four years, uh, treasurer for, for two, and I'm now a executive director. And uh, this market alone uh, generates over $7 million in economic value for the farmers and producers that are part of this network. And we've got uh, produce growers, vegetable growers, cheese makers, protein um, harvesters, pig, beef, buffalo, uh, and recently have also um, seen an explosion in folks that we call food entrepreneurs that are committed to sourcing locally and created value-added products from uh, those local uh, sources. So uh, we've got Farm to Taco, uh, Kaya, we've got the Juice folks from Virginia Beach, Fruitive, we've got Gordy's Pickles, we've got Supergirl, a whole new generation of committed food entrepreneurs that are sourcing from these farmers as well. One of the interesting things about city life is that cities actually turn out to be, I can't say they're all sustainable, but they, in many cases, city life these days uses fewer resources than, than rural life, which is really a very strange thing. But there have been a lot of studies done that show that although it's possible to live with a very low ecological footprint in a rural area, most people don't. That a lot of folks, when they move to the country, they commute much further distances, they have you know, a long driveway and cable TV and long power lines and things like that, and they actually end up using far more resources out in the country than they did in the city. That It, it turns out the average Manhattanite uses one-fifth the electricity of a typical Connecticut suburbanite right nearby. So cities actually already have a, a, a leg up in a way on sustainability because urbanites tend to use fewer resources the way that our society is structured now. That's not how it has to be, but American society right now, cities actually turn out to be pretty efficient places to live in terms of resource consumption. So we've already got a decent start there. Uh, the other really important leverage point in cities is that we've got large populations and often neighborhoods where the neighborhood itself can be fairly homogeneous. In other words, people who have kind of similar lifestyles, similar values in a, in a neighborhood. And those can be politically very powerful places where if a neighborhood gets together with a good strong neighborhood association and gets up in front of the city council or the mayor or something and says, you know, we need these sorts of ordinances, we need, you know, we need urban agriculture or we need legalized gray water or we want composting toilets or whatever it is, some, you know, some good green thing or we want rooftop gardens or we want our downspouts disconnected from the sewer system so that the water can go into the soil instead of out into the river or that sort of thing. Um, the political clout in urban areas for getting pol policy changes is very powerful just if we can just work a little bit better together. That 
you know, goes, goes back to what I like to talk about learning to work together. What are our common goals and how do we achieve those? And in urban areas, because of the population density and the relative homogeneity of certain neighborhoods, we've got very powerful tools for getting much greener, environmentally friendly policies through. I think that <clears throat> one of the, is I've started with and kind of what I bring to this job and to this struggle and movement is a focus on human behavior. The greatest impact are the choices that we make. Um, do you need two cars if you're in an urban area? Do you need one car if you're in an urban area? It makes a huge difference. The only time that you use your car is about anywhere from five to 10% of the car's lifetime. So making a decision about your transit choices, where you live, land use planning, and then for those that can afford it, depending on you know, what the cost is, do you buy local? Do you buy, um, you know, do your best to reduce the amount of packaging when you have a choice of getting one big box of something versus smaller boxes? Do you have the ability to, to get the big box? It's all those little choices you make throughout your, your day and your life that has a huge impact on, on the planet. And, that's the first thing. And it also models for your peers, and models for your parents, and models for your children, that the choices you make, again, could be riding a bike rather than taking a car for those short trips. It could be using a reusable bag or making the choice about um, buying food that's locally sourced. All these things have a major impact. It's, and we have to adjust, but it's important. We see with um, the gas tax no longer sustaining our public infrastructure because people are buying fuel efficient cars or they're driving less. <coughs> it has an impact, but a good impact. So what people need to do is, is to think about ways that they can live a more accountable life all of our choices have an impact. They don't happen in a vacuum. And then really pick the things that are important to you. I'm really, the reason that the city is focusing aggressively on waste is so many residents have said, we think waste is a terrible problem for the planet. Again, DC has no landfills. We can't have any landfills in the city and people bid to take our waste. You know, we, there's some cost to it. Obviously, the tipping fees and the cost of driving the trucks to the landfills, but it's, uh, it's something that our residents want. So we do have residents that are fighting for zero waste. We have residents that are fighting for just, we need to use renewables for our energy sources. We have residents that are fighting for more transit choices, trying to figure out how do we have a transit system that um, supports everyone and not just focuses on getting you in a car. <clears throat> and then land use planning. That in each neighborhood, figuring out land use planning so that you can walk to amenities rather than having to drive or take transit to amenities is life changing. It certainly um, has made a major difference in urban areas where we have so many people moving back to the urban areas Often now, it's the empty nesters from the suburbs that want to live a, um, a higher quality lifestyle because they can walk to what they want to get to. Challenge, of course, is keeping that affordable. If everybody wants to live there, then demand um, with, with not enough supply puts up the prices. So I think that it's important to have an accountable lifestyle and then pick out what you're passionate about. So what really got us into homesteading is we kind of came in through the back door. Um, I didn't start, we didn't, I wasn't raised in the country, I wasn't raised on a homestead, I was raised in a little subdivision, but even from a very young age I always had this passion for, for rural life. I just loved it, I was obsessed with it. When all the other little girls were playing with Barbies, I wanted horses and cows and land. And so um, I went into the horse industry and then we got, I met my husband, we got married and we decided that we were going to buy some property for our horses. 
So we purchased this property that we're on now, and our biggest obstacle that we came through first off was that we didn't have a tractor. So we, did, we were broke, newlyweds, we didn't have a tractor, and we needed a way to deal with our horse manure, because horses make a lot of manure. And so I started researching composting and ways to get rid of that manure other than using manual equipment. And I just, it opened up this whole world for me uh, that I didn't know existed. There was people still raising bees for honey and growing their own vegetables and keeping their own chickens and having their own eggs. And I was completely enamored, like obs just obsessed overnight. I couldn't sleep. I wanted to read about it and learn about it. Um, and it's really just been uh, a progression from there. So th and the main reason we really do what we do is First off is the quality of food is really important to us. So we raise a lot of our own food. That's our primary objective. And then beyond that, it's a lot of just quality of life for us. We love this lifestyle. We love living rurally. We love having our hands in the dirt. And so uh, those things together, it's really a great fit for us. So when we talk about carbon farming, we're talking about two things. One is, is taking, um, t taking the carbon that's in the atmosphere and putting more of it into the soil. Um, like through instance, spreading compost on rangeland or, or crops will sequester up to a half a, half a ton of, of carbon per hectare. And they've proven this over five years. UC Berkeley recently has done that through the Marin Carbon Project. But in addition to taking the carbon from the atmosphere and doing that, we're also going to reduce the amount of carbon we're putting up in the other greenhouse gases. So chemical fertilizers, synthetic fertilizers, release <coughs> huge amounts of, of um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and NOx, uh, nitric oxides, um, and that, and then the same way with um, corn and soybeans, a lot of you know uh, tilling of the soil, uh, releasing the carbon, uh, tractors uh, and chemical fertilizers, which we're using petrochemicals, we're, we're relying on petrochemicals to grow food and we need to rely on natural systems. And we can feed the world on this. This is a whole myth, you know, GMOs won't feed the world. GMO f foods are gonna kill the world because it's so industrialized. And we're also, one thing people don't realize about GMO crops, they, they're putting viruses and bacteria in the, in the DNA of every cell of many of these GMO crops. And, and, and that's never been done before. And, and this is more and more people are realizing, even the National Academy of Sciences which the biotech industry tries to say that they they say that GMOs are, are are safe. The National Academy of Sciences, and this is part of the presentation that I do, shows that they said that because they're changing um, unintended consequences can occur in food when they when they're genetically modifying the foods, and that we need follow up to study what could be some of those consequences. The average study for, for animal testing for, for crops that Monsanto and other companies do, the FDA doesn't do any, any food safety studies. They rely on the, the, the com chemical companies supply the data and they do it for 90 days. Whenever they feed the GMO crops for, for two years, they have significant health issues. Cancer, uh, you know, enlarged, et cetera, uh, large, uh, you know, liver. So, um, but not, we're not just talking about the health of the food, we're talking about the whole ecosystem. So it's really important that we don't just continue on this path where we put excess carbon in the atmosphere and we need to learn to bring it back into balance. So instead of carbon being our enemy, carbon can be our friend. The other aspect of an integrated closed loop production system is that it will build upon itself. Um, it's, it's fueled by sunlight, uh, growing plants. Um, the plants uh, shed their leaves or uh, die at the end of the season. Those nutrients are then taken up by the primary decomposers. The primary de decomposers make those nutrients available for new plant growth and a whole series, a whole web of other creatures that are surviving based upon the fact that those decomposers are doing their job. So last year, we started the deep mulch gardening method. And prior to that, gardening has always been my Achilles heel. I love the animals. I'm really good with the animals and the milk and the eggs. The garden was always kind of my point of contention. So we had a lot of weeds. Wyoming in particular is a very difficult climate to grow in. It's very dry, very windy. And so I was kind of at a loss. So I found this book by a woman named Ruth Stout, and she introduced this concept of dumping a whole bunch of hay on your garden. Like, 10 inches, 12 inches of hay, and then planting in the dirt and allowing the mulch to decompose and nurture the soil and cover the soil. 
And of course, at first I thought it was absolutely crazy. My husband thought it was crazy, um, but I kind of was at a loss. So I decided to give it a try. And that has really completely revolutionized how I've been gardening. When I first started the garden last year, um, we, I planted, or we put the hay down on the garden, a, a very thick layer. Now a lot of people say, well, if you put hay down, it's gonna cause weed seeds to grow. And that is true is if you do not have enough mulch. So you need that very thick layer. It looks crazy when you first do it. It looks absolutely insane, but do it anyway. Um, put all the hay down on your first, your first go, then spread the hay and plant the seeds directly in the soil, just like you would normally. And then after that, when the seedlings start to pop up and mature, you can pull the mulch around them and it really shelters them. It holds the moisture in and snuffs out any weeds that are gonna pop up. So until you get an orchard, which produces enough organic matter for its own right and then to supplement what you're losing over here in the garden and you get them connected um, or you take garden things and you put them under the orchard meaning we're growing watermelon and pumpkin and you know doing it over there and we get a real short system short circuited system is good um, those are the kinds of efficiencies that permaculture has brought to my thinking is if I hadn't taken the PDC I might still be turning hot compost <laughs> but I've evolved to the lazy man's way through the permaculture thinking the total volume of live of life in your system can increase cycle over cycle year over year um, because you're trapping that sunlight in living bodies so you're increasing the fertility in the system, increasing the energy contained in the system rather than depleting the system, which is most of our human systems are based on depleting the natural resources. So if we make that change, if we start working with integrated closed loop production systems, we can begin building energy back into the system again. Uh, Your Custom Homestead is an ebook I wrote back when I was still new into my homesteading journey. I'm just, it really expresses my passion for encouraging people to homestead wherever they are. So it's a 21 step program. It's designed to encourage people, no matter if they live in the middle of New York City or they live out in the middle of Wyoming, that to just take the steps necessary to start learning about their food, growing their own food, and pursuing that sustainable lifestyle. So it's really just a nice bite-sized chunk um, for people who are new to the whole idea. Um, the, the contrast between living in the, in the city environment and living here, um, uh, beyond the obvious, you know, visual and, and you know, day-to-day -day life, um, I, I think that uh, Knowing where all your resources come from and what happens when you flush a toilet or what happens when you, um, when you go buy something at a store. Um, you know, all of those circumstances and all of those, um, uh, all of those actions, uh, you're kind of removed from the whole chain of events in the city. Um, uh, that said, um, uh, the city life was also valuable um, lesson as well because uh, being in such a densely populated area there is also an element of um, of, uh, of accountability and seeing I exactly what happens in that environment um, but you know there's there's much more uh, peace obviously out and out in nature and um, but you but you get an idea of uh, what what human nature um, uh, is in that in that huge energy in the city and, and it's, a, it's a valuable lesson to actually take back to a place like this. I would say first off to expect a little bit of a sense of overwhelm. Um, there's a lot of different aspects to homesteading. There's gardening, there's animals, there's doing things like making your own soap or cooking food from scratch. So I always recommend to pick one thing that will benefit you the most, the most quickly, and then to focus on that. Don't feel like you have to go and master it all at once because that just won't happen. So most people when they're just getting started and they come in they say they've never gardened before, they want to get going on it. I like to get them going on something easy, you know, salad greens, potatoes, root crops, radishes. I mean, radishes will come out in 30 days. And salad greens you're picking on 25, 30 days. So I, I like to, it, it's a, gardening's a fun thing and it should be fun. So I encourage people to go out and, and just have fun with it. But, 
we uh, you know start with the easy stuff and then work up to the harder stuff and and, uh, and started getting those rotations in. A lot of people think it's just you garden it's like you fill the garden up and then you eat out of it. But it's really a, an art to to putting things in the garden, having things timed right, so you're as you're harvesting things, you've got new starts and new seeds to put in in that place. And if you do it right, you can get a huge bounty out of your garden each year. So some of the things that people can do, I mean, some of them are very basic, things that have been around for, for several decades are just looking at you know, making a building more energy efficient. If you live in an apartment or in a house, just, you know, the very elementary things like weather stripping and insulation and you know, adding maybe a layer on the windows or something like that. But I also try and give people a, a set of tools, like how do we evaluate what the biggest energy consuming appliances are in, in the house. And so what, a lot of what I'm trying to do is how do we find the leverage points? Like what can I do as a city dweller to kind of have the biggest change for the least effect where I'm not having to work lots and lots to get a small effect. And part of that is identifying the biggest energy consumers in, in the home and figuring out then what to do with that. You know, how do we fix it? How do we retrofit it? You know, do we need to get a new one or can we just kind of upgrade this one a little bit? Um, that sort of thing. So a lot of the book is how do we think about energy efficiency? How do we think about water conservation just so that we can come at it from a whole new point of view? So, so a lot of the tools in the book are, are kind of thinking tools like how do I identify the good leverage points in energy or in water? That sort of thing. And so we now realize that there are many facets of sustainability that are worth our attention and there are many solutions that we can apply no matter whether we're living in the city, we're living in suburbia, or we're living in a rural environment. And so these are the things that, number one, we need to recognize and acknowledge, and number two, choose. Which ones are most important for us to start focusing on right now? Which ones are most important for our families and our communities to start focusing on right now? And let's go out and do it. Let's grab a shovel. Let's grab uh, uh, some com. Let's start making compost and put it into our plants. Let's go get connected with the community gardens. Let's go start a community garden. Let's go get involved in local uh, political legislation to help create more sustainable environments in the city or in uh, suburbia. You know, let's go and use permaculture skills in our rural environment so that we're not depleting resources. We're actually creating closed loop production systems that are regenerating the land and helping us be more sustainable. So there are many things you can do. The reality is pick one and start with it. And the beautiful thing is once we start with one, you know, we're automatically encouraged and inspired to do something else and something else and something else. That's what's going on in my life, in my family's life, and it's so beautiful. You know, we're starting with food and then water and then, you know, we're gonna be moving to clothing and vehicles and, you know, more and more and more. We can take these steps all the time, moving forward to be more sustainable, more regenerative, and again, as I keep mentioning throughout the series, go beyond sustainability into a place of thriving indefinitely and to me that's what true sustainability is all about so thank you for watching tonight's episode thank you for sharing this with your friends and family thank you for being a part of our community and i look forward to talking to you in the next episode This is the light, this is the calling, this is our time.